So I'm William McDade, and I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, the ACGME. And I've come to visit uh, EVMS today uh, to talk to the program directors and the DIO, GMEC, uh, about the new program requirement changes that took place on July 1st, 2019 from the ACGME. In 2018, the ACGME spent about a year with a task force on diversity in graduate medical education. The task force came up with a number of recommendations, the first of which was to create the Office for Diversity and Inclusion and hire a chief, and the next was to figure out a number of different things around data that would actually help us to do better work, uh, and a number of other de deal with the admissions process for residents, the retention process, and um, a number of the other parameters that we can do to help enhance the programs across the country to build a more diverse workforce. While the ACGME was doing this uh, with the committee, uh, the board itself was acting to put in place new program changes that would actually direct directly the diversity and inclusion uh, of the workforce in graduate medical education. So there are three changes that I'm principally going to be speaking of, and they happen to be 1C and the common program requirements, which ask all programs and sponsor institutions to engage in a mission-driven ongoing systematic effort at recruitment and retention of a diverse workforce that includes residents, fellows of present, faculty, other GME staff, and academic personnel in the university or of the program. Um, the second deals with changes in Section 5, which have to do with how the ACGME interprets first-time board pass rate. First-time board pass rate is often something that the public views as important to understand how well their doctor has been trained. But there's not a lot of correlation that suggests that a first time pass rate means anything differently than a second time pass rate. And so the ACGME is really focused on making board certified physicians, uh, ultimately. And so for as long as you're eligible, uh, we're going to try to tabulate the ability to convert you from a person who is not board certified to a certified. What we're thinking is that the seven-year or so average rolling period is a more accurate assessment of how well we're able to bring new physicians who are board certified into the practice of medicine, as opposed to just the first time pass rate. By reducing the emphasis on first time pass rate, we might make it easier for program directors to choose candidates who are strong physicians, who are really good at acquiring sk clinical skills and knowledge, but in fact are not good standardized test takers. And there's a fair amount of evidence that suggests that standardized testing is, is related to socioeconomic conditions and that people who come from poor families don't take tests as well as people who come from wealthier families. That might be because there are more resources available, more opportunities available to practice testing. and Testing is taught at a very early period in some groups as opposed to others. We don't think this should stop you from becoming a physician of a certain type because your board score isn't as, is going to be as predictive or your step one score for the licensing exam is not going to be as predictive as it would otherwise need to be for program directors to feel comfortable and feel that their programs weren't in jeopardy uh, because of requirement from ACGME. I say all that to say with the de-emphasis in USMLE step one uh, surrogacy for how well a resident is going to do, I think we'll get better residents in more diverse disciplines and those are the things that communities will need in order to enhance their health care and reduce health disparities. The third area deals with Section 6B6. Section 6B6 deals with the environment, the learning environment, and it asks programs in cooperation with their sponsoring institution to develop learning environments that are professional, equitable, civil, and really eliminate all of the discrimination, sexual harassment, and other forms of harassment, mistreatment, abuse, and coercion of students, medical residents and faculty, and really acknowledges the fact that even witnessing uh, mistreatment or incivility is, serves adversely to impact a resident's training. So we hope that by putting these three program requirements in place, we're able to make these learning environments more inclusive of the diversity that we hope to establish and to improve the quality of education that everyone receives in medicine. I think the recognition that health disparities elimination has not really been something that we've seen great strides in over the last several years. The 
elimination of health disparities, if you looked at the Institute of Medicine's uh, compilation uh, in their treatise, Unequal Treatment, asks for a more diverse workforce. If you look at the uh, diversity of the GME workforce since 2004, 2005, uh, African Americans represented about 4.7% of the physicians back in 2004, 2005. They represent about 4.5% now. If you look at Latinx physicians, they represented slightly under 5%, and in 2005, they represent about 5.1% now. We haven't made any strides in the last 12 years uh, in terms of increasing the, the percentage of residents of color in particular, but uh, residents who are going to serve in underserved areas especially. And when you look at who's going to serve in underserved areas, AMC has actually done a fair amount of thinking about this, looking at both graduating classes and asking their tendency to want to practice in underserved communities, as well as looking at matriculating students. And the underserved groups who are, are the people who most likely say they were going to serve in these areas after they complete their training, then making more diverse physicians is really critical to try and get people geographically in the service communities where they can be most effective in eliminating health disparities. GME has heretofore thought of itself as more of the recipient of the medical or the physician pipeline. Uh, I'll use pipeline as a metaphor, but I, I think in deference to the feelings of Native Americans and, and what pipeline means to them, I'm going to call it pathway now. So in the pathway to becoming a physician, um, medical schools have been seen by GME, graduate medical education, as being the way that we can diversify the profession. GME hasn't really taken much of a role or responsibility of helping to increase the diversity in medicine because it felt itself to be the recipient of the individuals who graduate from medical school and having had no input into who goes to medical school, they absolve themselves of that responsibility. I, I think GME has a role that it can play in, in pre-medical education, helping earlier learners, um, helping people who are diverted into other fields come back into medicine through post-baccalaureate programs they can establish. I think that sponsor institutions often have barriers that restrict the access that young learners have to hospitals. And so if you want to try to figure out how you can better treat the influx of people into medicine, uh, GME plays a role or can play a role that it hasn't heretofore uh, played. I think that's the first thing. And for the requirements sake, um, we will see that a, a program is in substantial compliance if they are engaged in this type of work because you can't automatically overnight increase the pool of underrepresented minority people uh, in medicine. Uh, and so if I'm asking GME to increase diversity, it's going to have to start working with people before they get to medical school or even programs that actually enhance the ability of medical stu students to choose to come to GME programs. Uh, the other thing I think that GME can do is it can provide learning environments that are, are more successful for all folks who come to them. Um, that is, if you take a resident um, with respect to their, their USMLE score, their, their first part of their, their step exams, who may not be the best test taker yet, evaluate that person on the basis of performance on a standardized exam, the training exam, then you may set someone up for, for a failure. Um, what you have to do is if you want to bring people in with scores that are potentially lower in standardized performance, you'll have to figure out ways of helping to enhance their capacity to be successful on those standardized exams once they enter your residency program. If that means you develop learning specialists or you find access to them for exam prep, then that's what you have to do but the fact is that if you want diversity, you're going to have to do some things that you're doing differently now because if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. The, one of the most important aspects of the work that we're doing with workforce deals with healthcare disparities. And healthcare disparity elimination is also covered in our clinical learning environment review, a CLEAR program, in which we want all residents to learn about the elimination of health disparities. And we'd like to see how all residents understand and deal with the practice disparities that occur in their own performance. So through CLEAR and through these new changes that we've made and, and directly focused on diversity and inclusion in the workforce, ACGME hopes to play a role in the elimination of health disparities and the improvement of health for the American public.